God's people, it's Pastor Elizabeth Hiller, and I am joining you today from Key Largo, Florida. I am here at a conference for Lutheran churches, and I am learning about how God's grace can respond to difficult social issues like racism. Uh, and we are also learning today, our task is to make some plans for our congregations for life after COVID. So please know I'm thinking of you. This is not a Zoom background. This is a real palm tree. Uh, I'm thinking about you, uh, praying for you, and a whole bunch of people from around the country are here uh, hoping and praying with our congregation. Our scripture for today is from Acts 15. Then certain individuals came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. After Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to discuss this question with the apostles and elders. So they did. They went on their way by the church, and as they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, they reported the conversion of the Gentiles with great joy to all the believers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported to God all that had been done with them. But some believers who belonged to the sect of Pharisees stood up and said, it is necessary for them to be circumcised in order to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders met together to consider this. After their, that, there had been much debate. Peter stood up and said to them, My brothers, you know that in the early days, God made a choice among you that I should be the one through whom the Gentiles would hear the message of the good news and become believers. And God, who knows the human heart, testified to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And in cleansing their hearts by faith, he has no, made no distinction between them and us. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing on the neck of the disciples a yoke that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear? On the contrary, we believe that we will be saved through the grace of our Lord Jesus, just as they will. The whole assembly kept silence and listened to Paul and Barnabas as they told all the signs and wonders that God had done among them through the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied, My brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first looked favorably on the Gentiles to take among them a people for his name. This agrees with the words of the prophet as it is written. After this, I will return and I will rebuild the dwelling of David, which has fallen from its ruins. I will rebuild it and I will set it up so that all other peoples may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles over whom my name has been called. Thus says the Lord who's been making these things known from long ago. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And grace and peace to you from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. If there is one Christian hymn that people of faith know, and a Christian hymn that people from no faith backgrounds know, it is this. You know it too. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Amazing grace was written by John Newton. Uh, he lived from 1725 to 1807, and he came from a seafaring family. He was already a full-time merchant, a sea merchant, by the time he was 11 years old. So fifth graders, it's not that bad to have to go to school today. So after years of working on merchant ships, John Newton, this Englishman, became a slave trader. When he was in his early 20s, he had a falling out with the captain of the ship that he lived on, and he was actually sold himself as a slave to a tribe in West Africa. Uh, eventually, his father, who was still a merchant, heard that his son had been uh, sold as a slave, 
and he secured his freedom. Returning to England, young John Newton, who is at that age still in his mid-20s, uh, was in a terrible storm off the coast of Ireland. The storm raged. This young man, who had been an agnostic uh, most of his life, prayed to God for mercy and safety. He was spared. And from that moment on, it took about a decade for him. Uh, so don't feel bad if your spiritual journey seems to be taking longer than you hope. It took a, about a decade for him to call himself a Christian. During this time, he continued working as the captain of a slave ship. It was his job. It was what he knew. Eventually, the discomfort of what he did for a living turned to horror. He saw fully the sinfulness of his work. He quit working at sea. He became a banker. Eventually, he even became a pastor. Uh, after a decade away from the slave trade, he actually wrote a pamphlet which was, which was pivotal in English life at the time. Pamphlets were published by the dozens, and they were ways to have public communication, like Twitter or a blog post or a Facebook post now. His pamphlet was called Thoughts Upon the African Slave Trade, and his pamphlet sold over a million copies. It was provided to every single member of the British Parliament, and in his pamphlet, he, he did something unique at that time in conversation and oratory. Uh, he did this. As to your opponent, I wish that before you set pen to paper against him, and during the whole time you are preparing your answer, you may commend him by earnest prayer to the Lord's teaching and blessing. This practice will have a direct tendency to conciliate your heart to love and pity him. And such a disposition will have a good influence on every page you write. Instead of tearing his opponents down, which was the way of public communication then and maybe now, he prayed for his opponents. He asked God to give him love and pity for them. After he writes this pamphlet, he becomes embroiled in a public debate, and every single time people attacked him, he refuses to reply with anger. And because of his insider insight into the slave trade, he knew that he was truly a wretch who was saved by the grace of God. His love for his opponents ends up changing the public conversation. It was a slow process to abolish slavery in England, but it worked. Two, year, two months before John Newton's death in 1807, the slavery was abolished in England. Now, ever since humans were human, there's been serious, significant social division. Remember Cain and Abel. Think about the social challenges that we are experiencing today. Increased financial inequality, increasing percentages of children and elderly people living in poverty just in Clay and Cass counties. Racial divisions. Even whether we should be vaccinated or not has become this hot button issue, even in our counties. So as Christians, how do we approach these major issues? Especially issues that we know our faith absolutely has something to say. Our scripture today, it was long. Our scripture today really is important for this. How to disagree with family or other people who we love and respect dearly, even people who might be Christians. Sometimes they might be people we love and we might disagree with them so strongly. But before that, just a quick note, a note on how important Acts 15 is historically for us as Christians, because without this, this event happening in the early Christian church, there is a great chance that we wouldn't be here or here. Acts 15 is described as the council at Jerusalem. And at this council, the apostles declared that Gentiles, people who do not follow the Jewish law, like most of us, can follow Jesus without doing everything that you have to do to be a Jew. And this came in this small, tiny little Christian community 
after a real heated disagreement. And the trouble arose around the question, do adult males, Gentiles, need to be circumcised in order to be Christian? And this is part of a larger question, actually the same questions that we continue debating in our congregation around the world today about do Gentiles, do Christians need to follow all of God's laws in the Old Testament? Laws that we know are good gifts from God, like the Ten Commandments. Christian Jews in Antioch knew the law was a gift, and God gave Jews these gifts as a sign of God's promised relationship, God's covenant with the Jewish people. God said, follow these laws. They are a sign that I am your God and you are my people. For Jewish followers of Jesus, Jesus who was a Jew and followed the laws, it was hard to imagine to even contemplate a faith where following the law was not their way of life, their way of being people in the world. Even today as Christians, we really struggle to know which of the laws of the Old Testament to follow, which are meant for us and which aren't. A lot of the issues that the Christian church has had for 50, 60 years around sexuality really are about this question, which laws are meant for us and which are not. If you remember how uh, the, excuse me, the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians argued and they debated. They argued and debated more about what was appropriate for them and what wasn't. And they were not making any progress in this debate. So how in the world can this scripture guide us when we love somebody and when we absolutely disagree with them? Well, notice, notice what Paul and Barnabas and Peter did. Notice how God guided them through this. After lots of disagreement, Paul and Barnabas realized that they, they needed more help. And this is what they did. They left Antioch, Syria, and they went to trusted friends and colleagues all the way in Jerusalem. And this was a sacrifice. This was a 300-mile walk for them to do it. So you and your family or whoever it is that you really are struggling with, know that sometimes you are going to need trusted people in your life to help you get through a situation. You might talk to wise friends or Christians, faithful people that you know are wise, that have been through challenges. Or ask your pastor or a therapist to help you walk through something. Paul and Barnabas decided to go to these wise and faithful people in Jerusalem. And now, while the law and circumcision doesn't sound like a big deal to us, it was one of the primary signs of God's faithfulness to the Jews. So when Paul and Barnabas arrive in Jerusalem, the debate continues. The question is, is this law still a law for these people today? They found a way through the argument with faith, with trust in God. They looked to scripture and Jesus' own brother, James, who has become a leader in the early Christian community, reminds the crowd that's debating to look to scripture, to trust that God will speak to us through it, that God's going to bring people together. It's one reason why we spend so much time learning the stories of Jesus, learning how Jesus interacted with people. It's why our Sunday school, Wednesday school, our Sunday mornings really center us on the word of God for us. For us, God's word is to help us navigate a complex world. It's one of the reasons we hear stories all the time about who Jesus is for us. Because the better we know God, the better we know Jesus. The easier it is for us to navigate the challenges of our lives now. We trust that by knowing God, that we can follow him through whatever is in front of us. Then, after exploring scripture, Paul and Barnabas and Peter share their experiences with God. They talk about how they have seen God doing good things in the lives of the Gentiles, people who weren't circumcised. All three share how they've seen God moving. Now, this is good insight for us. Watch and see 
what people you trust believe. Look for those mentors to you in life and faith and seek out their counsel. And trust that God, if God is doing something with one person, that God will do this with multiple people. And you might call it multiple attestation, lots of sources to see what God is doing, that God is doing the same thing among lots of people. And finally, notice how Paul and Barnabas and Peter and the Pharisees who disagreed even at this time in Jerusalem, they still disagreed with each other. Notice how they stay in the conversation. None of them do the silent treatment. None of them get up and are angry and leave. They all stay in the conversation. And just like John Newton in the story we heard in the beginning of today's message, none of them went to nasty talk about each other. Notice that they're never harsh. There are no personal attacks. All of them simply stay in the conversation, trusting that God is going to make a way through for them. They recognize that every single person there is trying their faithful best, trying to follow God in difficult times. Martin Luther explains it like this. Explain everything that someone else is doing in the best possible light. That's how we understand the Eighth Commandment, one of God's laws in the Old Testament. There's a quote in an Anne Lamott book that goes something like this. Figuring out the way forward is like driving in the dark. You can only see as far as your headlights shine, but you still end up getting to where you're going. Now, disagreements stink. None of us want to especially disagree with people that we love and we respect. And disagreements aren't easy because we rarely see a good way or a whole way forward through them. We usually need some real amazing grace to keep hold of the world's most dangerous weapon, our mouths. We also need trust that through the Holy Spirit, that God will lead us to where we're going. God's people, we have the inspiration of the early Christian church, people who are human, just like me and just like you. And we see how God made a way for them and for you. Trust that whatever is on your heart and on your life, whatever is happening in front of you, that God does, that God leads a way, God will make a way for you. Thanks be to God. Amen.